And it is now time for a motion to adjourn with MP Chris Famous and Dwayne Robinson, JP. And yeah, we're back and we're going to move right to our second scheduled guest. And I'm used to the uh, music player. <laughs> so we, we have our author, Leonard Stapleton, who is an educator, accountant and historian who has taught for over 15 years at both primary and secondary levels. For the past eight years, he has been a part of the team that assesses and evaluates UWI teacher trainees in areas of geography, history, and social studies. He has served as Deputy General Manager of the Brimstone Hill Fortress and Honorary Treasurer of the St. Christopher National Trust. One of his main passions is researching and writing about French heritage of the islands, a certified tour guide, he also enjoys giving guided tours and heritage hikes. Currently, he writes, edits, and publishes Spectacular Views, a travel guide magazine to St. Kitts and Nevis. Leonard Stapleton is married with three young children. Welcome, Mr. Stapleton. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Are you with us? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? Welcome to Motion to Adjourn, and welcome to the people of Bermuda who are closely related Many of the people in Bermuda are closely related to the oh, people yes, of uh, Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I learned about that close connection to uh, a dearly departed friend of mine. Um, most of you guys up there would know him as, as Merchie, Merchant. Merchant. Yes, and uh, the the former Governor General, Sir Tapley. I think both of them had relayed to me how a number of persons living in Bermuda really have their roots here on uh, the island of Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's indeed. If we did a census, I would say at least thirty to forty percent of Bermuda's population could trace the, the heritage as not necessarily first generation, but second or third generation conditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. sir. So today we want to, as in cricketing terms, this is just the opening, the opening wicket <laughs> to. Um, to educate ourselves and the people of the, not only Bermuda, because later on this is going to be on YouTube, the mm -hmm. people of, of the of the region and the federation of the history of St. Kitts and Nevis, or as in proper term, St. What, what is the proper name for St. Kitts, sir? Uh, St. Christopher and Nevis. That's could, the you proper. could you say that a little louder? St. Christopher. How is my volume? It's coming good? No, no, I was I was joking. I was just wanting my host to hear that <laughs> the aisle is named after me. See? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're named after it. <laughs> yeah, so you have the floor, Mr. Stapleton. Okay. Um, normally when I give the history of St. Kitts and Nevis, um, I like to start at a point where there was no island here. There was no St. Kitts and there was no um, Nevis. Right. But just, just the sea water, just the Atlantic um, running straight into what we now call the Caribbean Sea. And uh, you would have understand that around that time, underwater would have been a whole shelf of coral reef. Mm -hmm. And around 38 million years ago, you had a volcanic eruption that forced uh, the material, the, the, you know, the lava and everything, up past the surface of the the sea, yes. and with it, some of that coral reef. So that if you go on some of the the hills and and the mountains, smaller mountains, and sink it, you will still find some of that coral on top of the hills, and that would give you proof in case you don't believe the story. So when you that, say when you use thirty eight million, what are you using? What are you using well, as your guard? Um, um, uh, you see, around the the early nineteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds, you had a set of geologists coming here, mm -hmm. and what they were basically doing were collecting um, rock samples from all over the island, and then later they used um, te uh, more advanced technology to examine these rocks. You know, they do carbon dating and different um, so to give the, the age of the rock. Mm -hmm. And what we have found is that the oldest rocks and both think it's and Nevis are actually what we call limestone. Mm -hmm. you now, limestone could only be from one place on the earth and that's underwater because limestone is actually coral reef. 
And so wherever you find limestone and land, no matter how high up you find it, that place originated under the water. And so it's around that time, based on the age of these um, rocks, that you could safely guess it's around that time the volcanic activity occurred to create um, Sankits and Nevis. And so on Sankits, those old rocks are not found all over Sankits. They're found in a specific region of Sankits. Um, they're found on Canada Hill, mm-hmm. Connery Hill, mm-hmm. and Southeast Peninsula. So those are the, a- the areas that are the oldest on Sankits. So Connery um, Outward Airport, you mean? Yes. Okay. Just and, letting you know, um, I know where that is. Yeah, and then for those who are following and have never been here, they could probably get a map and look and see. And they would notice all those areas are on the eastern side of the island, stretching down to um, the Great Salt Pond. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I, you know, it makes sense to start with the geological history is because eventually when people come to settle on the island, you would see the reason why they chose think it. Because think it as an island was, did not start off as one single island. Think it is the combination of at least seven to eight different islands <laughs> now joined together. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those would be some new, I guess, some new enlightening stuff. Um, if you go over to the Southeast Peninsula, and you visit the Great Salpan, or what used to be the Great Salpan, that there's now a development there. Mm, yeah, that's where Mr. Um, Sharp has his place, right? Yeah. No, not where, well, Sharp has his place on Friars Day, on your way towards the, the peninsula. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where Sharp has his place there, yeah, um, that's basically a, a body of sand that have been developed because the Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea meet right there. It's one of the most photographed areas on think it because you could stay from up at um, uh, Timothy Hill mm-hmm. and see the entire stretch of the peninsula along with Nevis in the background. And at that one spot, you could see both the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. Mm-hmm. It's less than, probably less than 200 meters away from each other. All right. Hmm. So you could basically, in less than four minutes, walk from the Atlantic to the Caribbean Sea. And so most tourists who come, they, they actually want to get a photo of that um, scenic area. Um, so just to get back to what we were talking about in terms of the geological history, because of the fact that the youngest part of the island, so to speak, when they examine the rock from the other parts of the island, the part that most people live on in terms of the Bastia area, even the central mountain range, they notice the surface rock dates for over a million years. And so that area of Sankit is basically a young um, area. And a lot of the different times when the island erupted in terms of the volcanic activity that formed the island, a lot of it was ash. So we had something that took place in 1912 in our history. And that is when we decided to centralize all the sugar plantations and produce sugar only in Bastia. So the plantations would continue growing sugar cane, but it would be manufactured not on the estates anymore with the windmills and steam mills, but in Bastia. Mm -hmm. And in order to get the sugar from the estate, we had to build a a, a, a railway. Now the railway has to be flat, and so wherever there is a hill, it has to cut through the hill. Mm-hmm. Now when you cut through the hill, even today when you walk through those areas, you could see the different eras when the volcano erupted, and you see different layers of sometimes mud flow, pyrocactic ash, um, different boulders and so forth. You get a nice uh, geographical history with that cross section. And you would notice now that a lot of ashes in the soil, and that is what I do, one of the reasons why the island of Sankit, as it stands even today, is the most fertile island in the Caribbean. Say that um, a little louder. Excuse me? Could you say that a little louder? It is the most fertile island in the Caribbean. So now I'm com- coming now to human settlement. Mm. So the first of people to actually live here 
Uh, there are some sources that say to the, uh, uh, the Sibonese, and these are Amor Indians. But the Sibonese were a tribe of Indians that actually loved to dwell in caves. And when you examine the number of caves around St. Kitts and Nevis, it's not enough to have really um, supported such a civilization. So the other sources that claim that there is the Tainos now, which we call the Aura, they were the first. And we do have artifacts that have been discovered here by archaeologists who for more than 100 years have been coming to think it. So they have old accounts and even recent accounts of um, artifacts um, being discovered by uh, these, this civilization. And when they apply their methods of dating these artifacts, they notice that some of the oldest artifacts go back to up to 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. So like so, 4,000 yeah. years ago. They, 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 well, more than 2,000 years ago. Be like no, no, I said 4,000 4, years ago. Oh, you said 4, yes. You would be calling, yes. So that is what you, we call now our pre-Columbian history. Mm -hmm. And more and more have been discovered because just recently, I think a week or two, I went to the National Trust just to see what's going on down there. And lo and behold, somebody on the eastern end of the island, I think it's in the Grange area, brought some pottery. And as soon as I examined the pottery, I knew straight away that these were um, Amerindian artifacts. One of them actually was the head of a bird. And it matched some of the thing. And this is how some of the archaeologists were able to pinpoint the civilization because the Tainos lived on different islands and so forth. And in some of the islands, the artifacts are well preserved, better preserved than in other islands. And so they could compare these artifacts when they find them other places and know for certain that it's from the same civilization. And so there's, the, the National Trust now have some that has recently been discovered. And so a lot of these artifacts come from burial sites and their garbage heaps. And these garbage heaps, the archaeologists got a fancy name for the garbage heaps. They call them middens. So you hear them speak that they discovered this midden and they found all these different artifacts. Now, a garbage heap might seem kind of reckless to us, but to the archaeologists, it's a treasure trove because you have bones and shells and different material that could give the archaeologists um, a lot of information about the diet and so forth, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and so books have been written. So I'm not just talking here where people cannot go and research for themselves. So there are books that have been written about the prehistory of St. Kitts and Nevis. So people can get more information on that. Um, the next set of people to come here would have been the Kalinago. Um, referred to, of course, by the Europeans as, as Carib. Now, Carib, actually to the Europeans, means eaters of flesh, or cannibals. Mm. And so, before they actually named these chain of islands, the Caribbean islands, they used to call them the Caribbees. So if you read old books 200 years ago, even up to maybe 150 years ago, they were referring to these islands as the Caribbees. Basically, spreading a propaganda back in Europe that these islands were inhabited by cannibals. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, yeah. When, you look at what, <laughs> when you look at what they did in order to settle these islands. They actually practice what, you, what we now call to the genocide. Mm. So when you're going to get rid of a, comp, a, a whole civilization just so you can lay claim to the island. Today we call it genocide, but you don't see the word being used in the old book. You, yeah, that's, see, the, that's the <laughs> irony. They call the, they call the <laughs> original people or second wave of people um, the cannibals, right? They mm -hmm. make them out to be the savages. But you're yeah. the ones that came down and killed them. And killed them, yes. <laughs> Wiped them out. So who's really the savages? Like? And what this did was not really indicative of all the, 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 the Europeans back then. Because they had to actually describe the people they're killing as savages. So that proper thinking people back home would just would say, oh, okay, they had to kill them. It's self-defense, you know? Propaganda. Because some of the people back in Europe, when they learned of the atrocity, they cried shame. That's, that's, no, that's similar to 
to some of the police nowadays who kill a kill a black man and say, "Well, my I felt threatened." <laughs> I had to yeah. shoot him. You gotta justify. I thought so he was reaching for his gun. That, and that's the thing. And then you'll still have. I don't paint all 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 the white people with the same brush. Because they would still have some white people who would look at that behavior and say, you know, that white man did something wrong. Mm -hmm. So normally when I, I try to give a, a complete uh, history, because believe it or not, in the history of think it and need it, you have some tremendous um, events that took place where um, white people actually came to the aid of the enslaved Africans. And so in... In my book, I touch on some of those um, events, just so that everything could be balanced. Uh, when, we, when, we were, sorry, yeah, yeah, we were up with Kalinagos, so that part that I'm speaking about is a bit further ahead. The mm -hmm. Kalinagos, I want to spend a little bit of time on them, because not much um, emphasis is played on this group of people, this all-important group of people. The Kalinagos were the ones who actually name the island of St. Kitts, La Amiga. Now, they have had the chance to live on most of the islands in the Caribbean. And you notice that they were actually farmers and fishers and hunters. And who better to tell you about the quality of the soil than somebody who's actually farming? And so they named the island La Amiga, which actually means the fertile land. So having lived on all the islands, they came to the conclusion that this island here, I think it was the most fertile. Now on the island of Nevis, they named that island Uali, which means the land of beautiful waters. And if you know anything about Nevis, you know one of the things that brought Nevis to fame were the thermal springs over there. And apart from the thermal springs, we have a lot of um, peated with cold water springs all over the island. And so even though they were not um, on paper scientists, people who went to Oxford or whatever, in their own way. They were, in my mind, <laughs> some of the best um, scientists in terms of the methods they used and, and interacting with nature and the land to survive for all those thousands of years. Here, in peace. In peace, they survive in peace because if there was that warlike, the the Tainos and the different tribes would have been wiped out by the time the Europeans encountered them. All the tribes that they, they claim that the Kalinagos were killing off, they actually died when the Europeans came. Mm. No, no, what, what caused that? The, the genocide, they actually killed them because many of the islands that the Tainos were living on what it happened to be the larger islands that had the gold and the silver that the Europeans were interested in. Mm -hmm. So we've moved now to the in, in our discussion to the introduction of the Europeans. Now all these islands were Spanish colonies, even though on some of the smaller islands Spain did not have a permanent settlement. They did lay claim to every single bit of land. I can't even remember the name of the line of longitude, but it was ratified by the Pope himself, who declared all the lands west of whatever line of, of latitude that belonged to Spain. And so eventually, other countries like, you, um, like England and France and Holland, th those countries wanted a piece of the action. And so when the Spanish came here, it would have been the late 1400s. As a matter of fact, think it is actually named off of the patron saint of Christopher Columbus, the man who led that first expedition and claimed all these islands for Spain. So there are some accounts that say he named the island of think it off of himself. Mm. So that, is, that is not true because you know Christopher Columbus was not a saint. He basically was trying to name the islands off of the saints of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So many of the islands, St. Martin, St. Vincent, St. Louis, all of those islands, even Trinidad, which comes from the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, 
all of the islands that Columbus named have some um, root in, in the Catholic Church. So even if you are not Catholic, just saying which island you're from or the parish you live in, you're paying homage to a Catholic saint. Wow. Can you write your address almost every day. I live up here in St. Peter's, and you know St. Peter is a Catholic saint. Mm-hmm. The island is called St. Christopher. St. Christopher is actually the patron saint of all sailors. And it comes from that story where St. Christopher took the baby Jesus across the river and everything. So what happened is that the, 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 the geology of, of St. Kitts, when Christopher Columbus was passing by, in 1493, the second voyage, it reminded him of a painting that has the baby, Christian Christopher taking the baby Jesus across the, um, that same river. And so that was the inspiration for naming the island St. Christopher. Mm. Now, when it came to Nevis, he named Nevis not half of a saint, but half of a miracle that they claim that Mary performed where she caused snow to fall in summer. And so before Columbus um, laid eyes on the island of Nevis, and I'm right now up at St. Peter's, and I have a good view of the island of Nevis, and almost always this cloud cover draping the top of Nevis Peak. As I'm speaking to you now, there's a cloud cover over it. And so it is said that when Columbus passed, this cloud cover on the top of Nevis Peak kind of resembles snow. And you know snow is not supposed to be on any mountain in the tropics. And so that was the inspiration for giving the name of the island the places, uh, the place dedicated to that miracle. For in Europe, there were already three places dedicated to that miracle. And those three places were called La Nuestra, the Senora, the Nieves, Our Lady of the Snows. And that was the long name they gave to that island. Eventually, you know how people be, people usually try to get the shortcut. They started to call the island Nieves. So in a lot of the old texts, you would find the island being called Nieves, which means snow. And then there are some books, as you get um, closer to our time, started to tell the word Mevis, M-E-E-V-I-S. And then I've seen one or two cases where they spell it M-E-V-I-S. And then eventually that M was replaced with an N and it's called Nevis today. Still means snow. So the island is actually, I think, probably the fourth place in history dedicated to that miracle. I think as it stands today, there are more than at least 20 of those um, 20 or more sites dedicated to the miracle of Mary causing snow to fall in summer. All right. So that's a lot of, <laughs> of things and of history out there. So we have we have approximately five minutes left. So so far we're going from the volcanic eruptions, going mm-hmm. through the um, first settlers, the native, the the na- I would say Native Americans. Um, oh, I think what I needed to do. I think I said I would spend some time on the Kalinagos. Mm-hmm. Right now, this is the scene that took place when so Thomas Warner um, created the first. English settlement in the West Indies. And that happened. And then January the 28th would have marked 400 years because it occurred in 1623, the 28th of January, 1623. So the 400th anniversary was the 20th of January last year. Mm-hmm. Um, when Warner came to sink it, and um, what I'm giving you now are from the logbook and the notes of Warner himself, so Thomas Warner. They were emaciated in terms, they were hungry, starving even from that long voyage. And he himself said he met, he was met on the seashore right there between those two rivers in Old Road, the East River and the Black River, by the chief. And that is the, when he named the, the Indian chief, that's the first time we got the name 
of a born and bred kitchen. And that was Chief Tegraman. I think later they met the son, who was called Tegramond. And lo and behold, the way he described Chief Tegraman, you know for fact that these people could have never been cannibals. Because he himself said that if it was not for the kind hospitality of Chief Tegraman, all of them would have, per- of, would have perished. Tegraman and his tribe were kind enough to not only supply them with food, not just for the week or the weekend, you know. For nearly three months, they were being fed and sheltered by these same Indians. Sounds a lot like, like, sounds a lot like the story up in um, 50 Pilgrims and the people exactly from England. It is exactly hmm. the same. Because whereas um, that gentleman in, um, in Virginia met up with, what's his name, what's her name, Poker Hunter, one fell in love with, I think is the most famous doll in the United States, Barbie. But before they made that Barbie, before Mattel made Barbie, we had a baby here. Now, she was an Indian. Mm-hmm. But it is not documented exactly which tribe of Indian she belonged to. Most sources believe that she was of the Taino tribe. And the English and the French, both of them kind of report that this lady might have been captured by the Kalinagos. And so, one actually had a child from this Indian lady. Now, I must let you know that Warner came to St. Kitts with his young son, you know, Edward Warner. Mm -hmm. But when he got the child from Barbie, he actually named that son Thomas Warner. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Warner became one of the first governors of the island of Dominica. Because when they murdered most of the Kalinagos and St. Kitts, the surviving one, including Barbie, they went to Dominica. So a lot of the Dominican Caribs, or Kalinagos, actually have their roots right here in St. Kitts. Okay. Wow. So we, so, have, we have approximately two minutes left because we okay. have another um, show, not our show, but another show. That's the start okay. at six. So. Um, so I'll just stay here for now. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Um, no, I think any questions to me because this a lot. A lot of this I knew, and a lot of it I didn't know. But I'll let I'll defer to Duane. Uh, for me, I just would love to you know dig into those first people a little more because you know it's very fascinating how you know they were able to kind of have a lot of spread to various islands. So I really hope. To have you back on so that we can you know dig more into that and and how their descendants are doing this and things like that if they have any yeah that that's very interesting because we even today without knowing it we are using a lot of the technology and a lot of the food stuff that these indians were actually using here on the island uh, for instance you know your crops like potatoes were unknown basically unknown even the tobacco plant, which, you know, the cigarette, smoking of cigarettes is one of the most popular things. All those were introduced to the world when the Europeans made contact with the Kalinagos and the Tainos down here in the West Indies. Even the way of preparing the cassava. You know, your grandmother and the different people in the village would prepare the two different types of cassava. The sweet cassava, that's easy. You peel that, you cook it, you eat it. But when it comes to the one that they call the bitter cassava, that is the one that astonished the Europeans because the juice from the bitter cassava is deadly poison. One spoonful could kill around 70 cattle. Hmm. And one bitter cassava could give you almost a bottle of juice. But the Indians found a way to extract the, that poisonous juice and still make bread and different stuff from the bitter cassava meal. Our ancestors actually do that. My mother used to do that. And most of the women in my village used to prepare the bitter cassava. But the juice 
it's a deadly poison. As a matter of fact, I think what they used to do with it is to use it to starch clothing. So, you know, the old guys who used to be in the police force back then, you know, the police force back in the old days were really looking for very tall and strong, muscular men. You couldn't be fat and stumpy and sharp, otherwise they're not going to make it in. Hmm. And when you see those guys polish their shoes and start their clothes, I mean, I tell you, you could shoot them dead, but their, their clothes will start, they will still be standing. <laughs> All right, Mr. Stapleton, we have to, unfortunately, we have to uh, pull, pull this, I wouldn't say pull the stumps, but we're going, we're going to tea time until the next innings. Yeah, I hope I didn't talk so much because when it comes to the history of Sekhet and Evis, you realize it's a lot, you know. No, no, that's what we that's what we need because, like I said, as uh, most most Bermudians have some, many Bermudians have connections to Sekhet, and what mm -hmm. we want to do over the course of the year is do a build up to show, you know, like you went even further than I expected because you're talking about from the volcanic formation coming forward, so. All of that is 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 good, and um, we look forward to having you on next. Um, you know, soon. I'll let you we'll we'll, we'll compare notes of what's a good date. I'm oh, sure. Always a pleasure. All right, and I just mm -hmm. want to give a shout out to my cousin Sheila Cable who made all this happen. Oh yes, she was the one who contacted me early. Yes, sir. So enjoy yeah. your day, I, sir. Thank but you. She was very nice and and cordial, so you know I couldn't refuse her. <laughs> yes, yes, that's her. That's her nature. All right, so thanks for having me, and, you know, best of luck to you and your audience. Somebody just Thank WhatsApped you. me and said, why are you only giving him 30 minutes? Well, the answer is <laughs> we had to give the BPSU, BPSU a little bit of time to talk about mental health. That's the answer. This, this, person, this person is of, of Cartesian heritage. He's actually a, 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 a distant relative of mine because when, when I compared notes and I did my DNA samples, his, his surname popped up, so... <laughs> Cousin, <laughs> chill to next time. This is a yeah. series. This is not. This is this is test. That's right. This is test match. This isn't twenty twenty. <laughs> we got more coming. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Mr. Stapleton. And for those who want to know, the we will have the recording on YouTube before the weekend's out. Thank you very much, oh. Mr. Stapleton, and thank you, Bermuda. You gonna close us out today? Yes, thank you. We hope to see you back, and uh, you be safe over there. And make sure you read the word Gazette tomorrow because these claims by, uh, what's the name? What's, what's his name last week? Who? <laughs> Guy last week, Raymond Davis, Khalid Wasi. I'm not going to go on that. Oh. <laughs> and we have been listening to Motion to Adjourn with MP Chris Famous. And Dwayne Robinson, JP.